first off, I want to start by saying thank you for, to Paul and the, the, uh, the rest of the team here at the Quincy Thomas Crane. I, uh, as a kid growing up in Quincy, I, I was always here. I, mean, I loved it, and it's such a beautiful building. And uh, to be invited to speak was such a, it's a nice little honor, you know, especially for a kid from Quincy. So here's a really good looking picture of me. Uh, it's old. Uh, this is pre-COVID, pre-COVID 30, 40 pounds probably. Uh, I actually could fit into my suits back then. Uh, tonight's going to be fun. I know that normally doesn't go with financial planning and financial literacy, but we're going to have a little fun. It's going to be interactive. Uh, as a guy that grew up in Quincy, I, I, um, you'll learn a little bit about my experience, but uh, you'll find that um, since we all pretty much are from Quincy in the South Shore, right, uh, we like to have fun. And serious matters can be spoken at serious times, but tonight this is a serious matter, but let's, let's enjoy ourselves, right? Uh, so there I am, yeah, pre-COVID. Uh, let me go through. Let me, this was working perfectly, by the way, before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for noticing that. I had a four-year-old. Uh, I have a four-year-old. Yeah, exactly. You know, I was going to say I have a four-year-old. I had him seven years ago, but then I would have lost all credibility because I'm supposed to know math as a financial guy. Like, he said he has a four-year-old, but he had him seven years ago. Wow. Not very good, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was a little uh, yeah, little little time ago. I think it was five years ago. Maybe some Grecian formula. Maybe I'm not going to admit it nor decline it. Um, but we're going to talk about a few things, right? Uh, why financial literacy is important. Obviously, get more from life. We can't do much without it. But before we dive into that, I want to talk a little bit about again who I am and why you probably want to listen to me. Uh, again, it's Jeff Sullivan. Born and raised in Quincy, um, uh, educated through the Quincy Public Schools uh, that afforded me uh, a nice little trip out to Iowa where I went to college. Post college, I lived in uh, Los Angeles uh, and then um, I lived in New York City for a long time through the decades of the 2000s. And uh, the firm, the investment house that I worked in at that time moved up to Boston. So I said, well, hey, why not? You know, I'm the youngest of four kids. I set the record at uh, Quincy Hospital back in 1971, 11 pounds, 4 ounces. Now, it's no longer there, and as the administrator of Quincy is everything, I already know that people are very upset that we don't have a hospital. However, I'd like to think that I'm going to hold on to that record of being the largest, fattest kid. I mean, let's be straight. 11 pounds, 4 ounces. God bless my mother. And if she's watching, how you doing? All right. So anyway, that's who I am. Uh, my investment career started again in 1994. Can't believe it's 28 years that I've been doing this. I've worn a f few hats. Uh, uh, in my years in, in, in New York City, I was a trader, uh, as well as an investment wholesaler working on Wall Street. Uh, my job there was basically to educate and advise the advisors, the wealth managers. And then um, after we moved back to, to Massachusetts, I took all that investment experience and I said, you know what, if I can do it in New York City, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. And I think I'm the first person to ever say that. Uh, a handful of years ago, I started Peacefield Financial, we're a retirement and wealth solutions outfit. Uh, for compliance sake, I need to let you know, uh, on my broker dealer is Satera Financial. Um, what does that mean? Uh, Satera Financial is my broker dealer. I essentially, in layman's terms, I pay them money to make sure I'm a good guy. Right? That's it. They're my compliance arm. They allow me to trade my clients' money, asset allocate, etc. Things that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, as well as my clearing firm um, is Pershing. Right? So uh, any money that my clients give me goes to Pershing, which is an arm of Bank of New York Mellon. You know? So being a Quincy guy, and having Quincy clients, uh, you get some good questions like, so where does the money go? Like, does it go to the Quincy Savings Bank? So, no, no, it doesn't go to Quincy Savings Bank. It goes to the largest bank in the world. So it gives people confidence in knowing that, right? So tonight we're going to talk about financial literacy. Um, what is it? Well, it's a, it, it's a lot of things, right? Um, and you're going to find that financial literacy creates financial goals, and we all have goals in life. 
And believe it or not, a lot of us don't. We think we do, we just haven't compartmentalized those goals. So when you look across here, the spectrum of different financial goals, think about it. You have financial goals with a vacation, college, emergency cash, right? You should all have six months of emergency cash, no matter what, right? Weddings, new home, etc. These aren't new, however, it's rare that people write them down and say, this is what I need to do to compartmentalize my wealth. My strategy needs to start today. How do I do it? How do I plan for the wedding? It's simple. You take money and you carve it out and you put it there. The same thing for retirement, travel, etc. I think, has anybody gone on a vacation where instead of paying lump sum up front for it, you decided to go ahead and dollar cost average essentially. Every month you're paying a little bit too that vacation. Anyone? I did it once, right? It was a free trip. It was like I won a free trip. 600 bucks every month and then after a year um, my girlfriend at the time and I went on this amazing cruise and I was like I didn't even pay for this. It was insane how good it was. But um, those are the little things that you can go ahead and create um, and those things are obviously memories. Okay, so from there, financial goals. Now, you look at the last slide and you say, geez, that's a lot of goals. You know, I don't have, I mean, I don't know if I have the money to be able to do that and afford it. Well, the financial reality is not a lot of us do. So don't feel alone because you don't have those assets, right? Think of this. Four in 10, 40% aren't able to cover a $400 expense. I was saying, Ryan, he just turned 21. As he goes out to the bars and restaurants, four out of 10 people, that means four out of 10 people that are bellied up to a bar can't even afford to pay that tab without going into debt, right? So for younger people watching, don't be one of those people. Don't be picking up the bar tab either. Don't have to do that, right? Because I can tell you, uh, partners like you having money and not debt, it's important. So don't pick up the debt. Three steps to financial freedom. Again, there's three, three constants, they're not even variables. Three, ca the cash savings, your checking money, et cetera, uh, your cash, excuse me, your savings in, in checking account, your asset accumulation, and your wealth transfer. Um, gonna touch on th all three, and then throughout, when we wrap it up, we'll go back, we'll ask questions in regards to if it would, we didn't cover, or, and then we can talk um, a little bit more in regards to the questions that you have. But, cash savings. This is your savings account, right? People love, well, at least I did when I was a kid, looking at my little passport and seeing my savings go up, right? Kind of cool thing about this is when you look at the U.S. personal savings rate, what jumps out? Obviously, 2012 jumps out at you. Does anybody know why 2012 jumps out where the, uh, the average uh, savings was 12%? Which is huge, it's a huge number. Remember in 2009, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, we had the credit crunch, right? We had the Troubled Asset Relief Program where 700 Geithner put together 700 billion to bail out the banks that took on the credit default swaps and so forth. I was in Dallas, Texas in 2009 at a conference that we just paid $50,000 for me to get up and present to 900 people. The night before the conference, I was sitting there talking to my counterpart at AIG, uh, the largest insurance company in the world. And he says, I'm Sullivan, so of course I'm Sully. He says, Sully, you going on tomorrow morning at nine? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm kicking off the meeting. He's like, yeah, um, listen, uh, we're probably gonna declare bankruptcy. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Like, I, I mean, there's rumblings and stuff. He's like, yeah, so, um, yeah, Hank Greenberg is, is, he's gonna probably declare bankruptcy. So we're, uh, I don't know, I'm going on after you, but I might not be here. And I was like, well, why wouldn't you be here? He said, because here's the thing. We're the largest insurer of airlines and aircraft in the world, and if we declare bankruptcy, you're gonna walk back to New York City. So I was like, hmm, all right. So, finished my drink, went up to bed, 
rehearsed my presentation, and I got up, and I quite possibly, next to this presentation, of course, right, did the best presentation of my life. I got up on stage, there was about 400 people, not 900, meaning 400 financial advisors. I'm like, you should all leave the business, you're terrible. You should not be in this room listening to me, you should be taking care of your clients' worries. But I get up there and I said, hi, my name is Jeff Sullivan, I work for blah, blah, blah. Um, we spent really good money to go ahead and speak to you today, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it back to you. In the next 45 minutes, I'd like you to go back to your room or wherever and use that time a lot to go ahead and call your clients and tell them with the investment vehicle that you're invested with us, you're insured, you're fine. You have nothing to worry about. Um, however, if you're not, definitely go ahead and talk to them because it's gonna get really ugly in about at 9.30, right? So, got out of there and I flew to the airport. I like, I was seriously like, I'm gonna walk back to New York and I got home. But the reason why I tell you that story is it scared the, the bejesus out of everyone. People were afraid because you couldn't even invest in banks. Banks were going under, right? There were insurance companies that were buying mom and pop banks in the Midwest, Minnesota, for like $12, 12 million so they could go ahead and qualify for the troubled asset relief. It's insane. But we as Americans recognized a problem with the banking system, the repeal of the Glass-Steagall, et cetera, et cetera, and we started saving more. But we are Americans and our memory is short. So we started spending more and that's great. We wanna spend. Spending more facilitates the upward mobility in your portfolios, your stocks, bonds, et cetera. You spend, you're buying things that are in your portfolio, right? It helps, it's good, it's a cyclical process. But anyway, we go through there and uh, we learned a little, we forget a bunch. So start with a budget. So in your bag, I hand it out, and if you're at home, just grab a pen and paper. But we're gonna talk about this, and, and you don't have to grab it now, but we're gonna talk about this at the end of the presentation. Uh, it's defining what wealth means to you. It's a nice interactive way to go ahead and create conversation and create things that you want to do uh, and you think about. But um, you know, on this, uh, on this thing it says, our trip to Paris was really wonderful. So like, that's what wealth means to this person. What does it mean to you, right? And I think once we build the plan, there's no longer like, oh, well, I'm you know, paying my mortgage is just so wonderful. I love paying my car insurance. No, we want to have memories, not bills, right? So who, here's just a, a quick question on paying off debt for your cash savings, right? So. Who would pay off the debt or who would save? All right, so with a show of hands, who would pay off the debt? All right, okay. Who would save instead of paying off? All right, so one person would save. All right, so, um, and since nobody knows who raised their hand, that one person, I'm gonna show you why you were wrong. Um, they're over there, they didn't, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but there's this old saying, it's better to be safe than sorry, right? We, we grew up with it. I'm gonna take my money, I'm gonna put it under my mattress, it's gonna be safe, I'm not gonna lose anything. Well, today the Fed came out, anybody know what the in inflation number was? 7%, highest in 32 years was it? 7%, the easiest math on that is if you were to buy a bag of chips today, it's a dollar, right? Last year it would've cost you 97, 93 cents, pretty much, right? So the average cost of a movie ticket, clearly, again, not to harp on our friends in Minnesota, but $9, I mean, really? I haven't been to a movie in 20 years, but I know it was more than nine bucks back in 2022, which is, or excuse me, 2022, 2002, which is absolutely mind blowing. 20 years ago, it was 2002, that's crazy. So anyway, this is what inflation is, and the reasons being is you don't want to keep a ton of money in your cash savings. Cash savings accounts don't do anything except get bankers rich. That's all they do. They take your money, they invest your money. That's all they do. Um, there is a lot behind that, but you know, for, 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 uh, for simplicity's sake, that's pretty much all they do. So cash savings are great. Again, keep six months in bills for your needs. Um, if you have more, it's fine. Less, 
something to work about. Also cash savings, and then there's a thousand slides, by the way, in regards to this. I try to go ahead and define brevity, so I want to reduce a lot of it. Uh, for the younger folks, like Ryan, we were talking earlier, um, life insurance gets such a bad rap. It's a terrible, terrible rap, and it's, it's a really unfortunate because life insurance is kind of a really good investment vehicle, and if you have the right financial advisor, they can really find some great tax loopholes, uh, and I love the word loophole, it's legal, it begins with L, right? That can really facilitate some incredible tax-free income using life insurance vehicles, but in this case, for cash savings, these are two examples of why starting early matters. The biggest asset that you have is not in your wallet, it's not in your bank, it's not in your 401k, it's not your house. It's the time that you have between now and when you decide to start using it. So, at a male at the age of 30, this is on a 30 year contract, you're spending $62 or two bucks a day to get a half a million dollar life insurance policy. Right? The total spend on this term life, in, life insurance is $22,000. So as Ryan said, he's like, that doesn't sound right. You're giving me 20, 20, two bucks a day is gonna give me a half a million dollars if I die? It's like, yeah. If you die, that $500,000 is gonna go to someone, your beneficiary, and the coolest part is it goes tax-free. Pure tax-free, that's $500,000. So there's little things that you can carve out to do while you're still young, for those of us um, in this age bracket and so forth. And again, time savings, it's less expensive when you, um, when you get and when you age. Now, to just wrap up this one little piece on life insurance, uh, those, I think we all grew up again in that, that it sounds too good to be true, right? It's like, I spent 22,000, if I died, you gave my beneficiary, my mom, my dad, my wife, my husband, $500,000. The thing is, if you live, if he lives to 60, what happens to that 22,000? It's gone. The insurance money, the insurance company won. Right? So that's the caveat, if you will. That's why life insurance sometimes doesn't get a great rap. It's like, well, I bought a term policy. Just to know, in regards to life insurance, there's tons of different types of vehicles. You have universal life, variable, whole, term, et cetera. Um, I do a lot with my financial, just on a side note for my financial planning, I do a ton of life insurance simply because it makes sense. I can't do, it, there's no reason why, if I'm gonna pick a ARKK ETF, Kathy Woods ETF, and you know, double your money, granted if I invest in July, I would have cut it in half, but there's no reason for me to make money if the IRS is just going to come in and take it, right? So it's always a good way to go ahead and facilitate some of the, uh, the prudence of portfolio building. Anyway, so that's cash savings, right? Learned a little bit about why to use it uh, or why not to go ahead and continue to use it. Asset accumulation, this is when you hear of these uh, asset accumulation, stocks, bonds, etc., uh, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, um, ladder bonds, everything like that. There's three constants that we look at. Again, time, the money that you have, and then the rate of return. Um, from there, let's see, I just blew right through that. <laughs> so, uh, again, the value and the asset accumulation, the value of time. Time is our biggest, uh, biggest asset. And this is just a basic hypothetical in regards to the number of years you have to invest if you were investing $100, $200, $300. All right. um, this stuff is, you've seen this before, the more years you have, the better off you're going to be. Um, not to, to beleaguer this one, however, I do, um, I run some large uh, retirement plans. 457s, 401ks, 403bs, etc. Um, over the last handful of months, there's been incredible volatility in the NASDAQ composite, most, mostly. The S&P 500 has been cruising, the Dow Jones has been cruising, the major indices have been cruising. The tech market has been getting really beat up, um, with some positions down 20 plus percent just year to date in the last 11 days. It's, it's very aggressive, and you're just like, wow. So. Um, I get calls from folks and they're like, hey, you know, uh, 
I lost eleven dollars the other day. It's like life is gonna end, man. It's over. Yeah, eleven bucks. But kidding aside, I don't care if it's eleven dollars or eleven million, that means something to these folks, right? So when I get a call and it says I lost some money, I have to go ahead and talk to them. Clearly. That's what you do as a financial advisor. Outside of you know, you build portfolios. The majority, I would say 80% of my time, is spent talking to some, my clients. Just, it's going to be okay. We're going to be fine. We have a very solid structure here. There's a process. We walked you through it. We educated you. The thing about this is, for anybody participating in a, an employer retirement plan, on average is 253 days a year that the, mark, the stock, stock market's open. 253 days. Right? So, when you think, start to think about it, it's like, okay, I participate in that, or I have an IRA or something, right? Every 10 years, that's 2,530 days that you're going to participate in the stock market or the bond market or the emerging markets or international, etc. That day that it's down, you know, 100 points or 500 points or 1,000 points or even, um, that's one day of potentially thousands. So, when you really take a step back and you look at it, and you, it's going to be okay, right? When we first started talking, and when I first started talking, I talked about how if you just could send you to sustain life, buying the pro, buying, spending money, right? Don't save, just spend it. You're still supporting the underlying assets that are held in those investment portfolios. So that cyclical nature, by you spending money, it's going really right back to you in the form of. Uh, the fundamental principle of being earnings. So, um, again, a little bit more about weighting uh, asset accumulation investments to save. Um, when it comes down to year one to year 18 uh, for the finer print, it's if you were saving a total of $25,000 a year at an 8% hypothetical return, you'd reach $100,000 in 18 years. Um, it's, you know, again, time, it, it, it creates most opportunity. Uh, okay, so with the accumulation of assets, you have these three different buckets, taxable, tax-free, tax-deferred. Right. Taxable is referred to as non-qualified. In any type of uh, sit down with your advisor that he's going to talk about or she's going to talk about non-qualified assets versus qualified assets. Qualified is tax-free and tax-deferred. Non-qualified is stuff that you're paying taxes on. Right? If you are invested in, you decided to take, say, $1,000 out of your savings account and invest it into a stock, and that stock happened to go up double, let's just say, hypothetically, in a year, that 12 months in one day, that's a long-term capital gain. You'll be taxed at 20%. So if you've made $1,000, you got to pay Uncle Sam 200 of that, you net $800. That's a nice thing. If you were to sell day 364, that's a short-term capital gain, and that's going to be taxed as ordinary income. Not good. It's terrible. You don't want to pay ordinary income tax, because it's usually going to be higher than 20%. Right? So, that's non-qualified assets. If you're invested in non-qualified assets into mutual funds or exchange-traded funds, anything that generates ca long-term capital gains, short-term capital gains, or dividends, in that, port that calendar year, you'll be responsible for the taxes that that portfolio manager, he, he or she, resulted in by actively trading that portfolio. So when you're looking at um, different investment vehicles, you want to see how well they're tax managed. You want to find out what's the turnover and so forth. It's a lot of stuff that we look at. Like we don't want to go into if it's non-qualified. We don't really want to get into a very aggressive uh, portfolio management team because it's just going to generate a ton of taxes. And I can tell you, um, since we just passed November, a lot of times people are like, "Oh, I've, I got a little extra money. Let's go in and let's invest." It's like, "Oh, okay." They invest in November. What they do is they buy the dividend and capital gains of the portfolio for the entire year. So they sit there and they're like, all right, well, I just got a, I got a, I got a 1099, what's going on here? It's like, well, you probably shouldn't have listened to that guy or gal. You probably should have just sat tight 
because all you're doing is buying a tax responsibility. Tax free, everybody get that, right? It's big, again, it's non-retirement stuff. Tax free Roth IRA, cash value life insurance and municipal bonds. Um, the only one right now that we really should be looking at is the Roth IRA or cash value life insurance. Uh, municipal bonds, because of the, uh, I, I hate to use the term depression, but I think we all understand that if, if a bank down the street is lending to Joe and Jane Doe for a 30-year mortgage at 2.75%, um, then mortgages are pretty low and ta bonds in general are very low. There's a risk reward that comes with that, right? So municipalities, when they issue bonds, they have to issue them to people want to buy them. And you, there's, you have to look at the credit, credit worthiness, right? credit rating, their claims paying ability, which simply means if we lend money, will you pay it back? All right? Now, if you bought a bond from the city of Quincy, you'd get a higher rate than you get with the United States of America. Because the claims paying ability on the United States of America, which is kind of ironic, is with $30 trillion in debt, uh, is better than the city of Quincy. We don't have the Federal Reserve just to crank out money at the Treasury, right? So um, municipal bonds right now, great vehicle, tax-free. However, the yields are so low, the value's not there so much. So uh, what we look at is to gather the breadth of higher rated or, or excuse me, lower rated junk, which is not a bad, bad term when it comes to bonds. Uh, and we'd rather get, well, looking at your, your overall structure and your, your, your um, tax bracket, we'd rather get, if we could get a 7% high yield rate of return with equity exposure after tax, which would be an after tax yield of say four and a half, absolutely, 100%. We will go for that more than municipals. Since we're in Quincy and I love my hometown, Quincy's rating, I believe we're double A, that's pretty darn good, right? A um, lot of people talk about the parks that, that, that are being built, the infrastructure improvements, or the lack thereof, right? Um, different people or different departments getting raises, not getting raises, etc. All those different variables, they all boil down to one constant, and that is the claims paying ability of the city of Quincy. Right? I've got to know our chief financial officer, uh, Eric Mason. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And I have a full faith and trust in his financial background as well as his expertise and direct the direction that the city of Quincy is going. See, when people talk, you know, like, who, does, who lives in Quincy? Okay, so almost everybody, except the people from Minnesota. So, <laughs> but, so we all talk about, oh man, it's, uh, you know, the, the taxes are going up and so forth. The ad valorem, the property taxes, et cetera. Yeah, they're going up, you know, and, and I'm like you. I'm like, oh man, geez, can they go down, right? Just go down. The reason I, I you know, not to get into this too much, but the benefit of having um, the financial and fiscally prudent individuals at City Hall, granted we do see a lot of stuff going on, is to support the underlying debt obligations that the city of Quincy issues. And if we are issuing at a double A, that means it's a higher rated bond and the issuance doesn't have to be at five, six percent. It can be at two, three percent. So we're saving a huge ton, a ton of money by doing that. Did anybody follow me? I shouldn't even get into that. But anyway, that's a call. Like, hey, Jeff, tell me a little bit about that. And then again, don't tell me about that. <laughs> I don't want to know anything about that. The one thing that we can walk away with the municipal bonds is the city of Quincy and the, the powers that be at City Hall are doing a pretty good job. No matter if you, you, you hit a pothole and so forth, the credit rating is really, really important. They're doing an amazing job in facilitating that. So uh, tax-free, super important. Tax deferred. Who has a 401k or any of these, right? Pretty much all of you. With these, if you sit down with a financial advisor and this is her first question isn't, do you participate in your 401k? Get up and walk out, right? The reason is this essentially is like free money, okay? 
tax deferred investment vehicles of the 401k, 403b, 457. Let's just go ahead and put this to bed. These numbers here, this is IRC, Internal Revenue Code. That's all it is. Just that's what, oh, okay, page 55, all right, great. They're like page 401k, that's what it is, that's all it is. These investments provide the opportunity to either invest pre-tax or if you have the benefit of having a Roth provision on that plan, post-tax, okay? So on a 401k, a 403b, a 457, they're all taxed at the same rate. The big difference between these, the 457 was created by politicians because that's what they do and there is no 10% penalty should you uh, leave that employer and take that money and spend it. Anybody else on a 401k or 403b, if you left your employer and took that money and said, ah, I'm just going to spend it, you'd be taxed 10% penalty prior to 59 and a half and then you'd be taxed as ordinary income. So I always tell clients before they start to dive in, if they lose their job and so forth, a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, I got 180,000 bucks sitting in my 401k, I just lost my job, oh, I can use that. Really? Okay. So let's dive into that real quick. If you have a 401k with $100,000 and you decide to use that prior to the date that you're supposed to use it, and that being retirement date, if you're under 59 and a half, You'll be taxed on 100,000, you'll be taxed $10,000 right off the bat in a penalty. That's the penalty phase. And then, whatever your tax bracket is, your adjusted gross income for that matter, after all you're doing your taxes and so forth, if you're at that 100,000, you're going to be taxed at 100,000. They don't take the $10,000 penalty off the top, you're still taxed on that too. So, if you're at 100,000, say combined, you're at $35,000. Uh, tax bracket, that means you're paying Uncle Sam of that $100,000, $45,000. So you're only going to net $55,000. We won't even get into the opportunity cost. The opportunity cost is something that people really talk about, uh, but really briefly, when you take a loan from your 401k or your employer plan, it's like, oh yeah, no, HR will be like, oh no, you're good, take your loan. You, you, you pay your interest back, you pay yourself back. It's like, oh good, yeah. And you're losing all the opportunity by missing out while that investment continues to go and grow, right? The S&P 500 was up 26%. If you took $100,000 out last year because you wanted to put an addition on your house, well, guess what? You just paid $126,000 for that addition. So that 1% return that you're paying interest on yourself didn't really quite work out. Obviously, it can go the other way. It can go down. But um, I always tell people, take it easy on the, on the employee, uh, your, your loans. It's nice if you get in trouble, if you have uh, credit card debt, you're paying out 20%, 18%, etc. in credit card debt. There's nothing, the stock market can't guarantee you a rate of return. Take a loan, pay off the debt, and then pay yourself back through that. Right? Because the one thing about credit card debt is the guarantee that you're paying debt. You're paying a massive um, expense. So with that said, if you're not participating in this, definitely contact the Human Resources Department and speak to them about doing that. Um, again, most employers, especially most private, uh, this is a feature to go ahead and attract and retain um, qualified and good employees. So they usually put uh, a 3% uh, match on that. So how that works, if you're, say, let's again, make, you're making $100,000 and you decide, I'm going to go ahead and put $10,000 away. I'm going to put 10% away to my 401k. That goes in pre-tax on a 401k. So Uncle Sam looks at your, your W-2 and says, oh, you made $90,000. You didn't make $100,000. That money sits in that account. As long as it's in there, it's growing tax deferred in compounding the interest in all those taxes that you'd be paying in portfolio management and this, you retain all those and those also grow. So instead of paying the, paying the tax man, you're retaining those assets and those too are growing. So the, ta the, 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 the 401k, 403b, 457 on one end is just an incredible um, opportunity that the government has given us. 
And on the other end, super PACs basically said, we can't afford pensions anymore, so give them that, right? Because nobody has pensions anymore outside of municipalities, townships, etc. Um, we can get into that in a whole other conversation. But yeah, it's like, really? Thanks for this. But now I really don't have a pension, which would be nice because guaranteed income is really cool. We can get into that. There are other vehicles that you can get into uh, that will provide that. So asset accumulation, um, investment risk, it's inherent uh, in retirement. Uh, you have market risk, interest rate risk, health and longevity, uh, safety, liquidity, short-term investments, long-term investments, growth-oriented. The, these facets here, right? Um, retirement, retirees face same risk as other investors. It doesn't. There, there's no discrimination within the stock market. It doesn't care who, how old, It doesn't care who you are, how old you are. If you invest, you're going to have volatility. Um, you need to carve out, again, compartmentalizing your budgets and your reasons. If you want to go on a trip like that, you know, the cruise or whatever, vacation in a year, you don't buy a small cap emerging markets fund, right? You don't go ahead and load up. Amazon is great. It's 3,600 bucks a share. It's a blue chip. It's phenomenal. No, you don't do that. You look at a short-term investment for safety and liquidity. Might get a little aggressive, but you're not going you know, full bore into it. This type of um, positioning here is for retirees with 10 years plus. All right, if you have 10 years prior to retiring, you need to look at the overall uh, path and say, can I afford that risk? Remember, if you lose 50%, how much do you have to make back to get back to even? 100, right? A lot of people don't know. They're like, oh, I just lost 50%. You've got to make 100% to get back there. Not many vehicles, especially after losing 50, will go ahead and, and, and recoup that. Um, but anyway, any questions on that? It's fairly self-explanatory. I know I'm flying through it, but uh, there are investments. They're inherent in everything that we do. It's all predicated on your time horizon. Risky, longer, short term, safety. Social Security, um, the, the, the biggest, this question comes up all the time. The number one answer to Social Security when people ask me about it, what is the question usually? When do I, yeah, when do I turn it on? I'm like, well, hey Jeff, come on, when do I turn it on? I'm like, you turn it on when you want the money. Just, just enjoy it. Turn it on when you want the money, all right? The government plays games. So I say, hey, you know, wait a little longer. We'll give you a little extra, right? Okay, you go to 670, oh man, you're gonna get 132% more. Just take the money. Because the thing is, it's kind of, and it's not analogous to this, but it's like winning the lottery and saying, do I take the lump sum or do I take the annuity? No, you take the lump sum, right? They take the lump sum because you want to have control. And then wealth transfer. This is something that um, I get, this, this is where, a, this is a two day conversation, right? But um, wealth transfer, there's three keys. Remember when we started this thing, right? It's like accumulation of wealth. It's like, okay, through savings, you're checking in savings account, through investing, and then wealth transfer. We're in the process right now, we're right in the time where the greatest generational wealth transfer in our history. Trillions of dollars is moving through one generation to the next. It's fantastic. It's like, hey, thanks for dying. You gave me a ton of money. This is good. You know? Oh my God, you had a life insurance? It was tax free? Oh man, you did all right. Right? But that's the three keys are will. You need to have a will. Power of attorney, most of us have a will. Well, 40% of us. Power of attorney is always, but the healthcare proxy is super, super important as well. I don't care how old you are either. It's super important to sit down with a tax attorney and get that all in shape. You don't know, especially given the times that we're in with the COVID and all that stuff, you don't know when you may need the healthcare proxy, which is simply allowing somebody to make the decisions for you while you're incapacitated. It's pretty much it, right? So, um, wealth transfer, I always re go back to this simply because of this. You can be the most savant investment advisor, uh, portfolio manager, 
he or she can make you tons of money. It means nothing if you die and you don't have one of these, an estate plan, right? a will. Um, and with that, I would say that the other number, everybody know the number five for the five years when it comes to estate planning, get a five year look back. Right? That means the five year look back is Uncle Sam will come in if you need Medicaid and so forth and you all of a sudden are now being put into an assisted living space, Uncle Sam will eradicate your, your, your estate. They will take everything, take all the money. And we've all been there, like with pa parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and family. They will take everything. They will make sure that whatever penny you have left to pay that assisted living, it will come out of that estate and they will leave you nothing. Sitting down, spending that 1600 2000 plus contingent on the size of your estate is the best money you're ever going to spend. However, here's the thing. You don't spend it. Your kids spend it. They pay for it because you'll be dead. <laughs> All right? And so, I mean, no, like, if it, if that's what we do with my mother. My mom was like, why am I, pay why, why, why am I paying this? You, you pay for it. I'm like, oh, all right, I guess. Yeah, it makes sense, right? But um, yeah, it's important to have that. So um, I can leave you with this with the wealth transfer. So I, I, it, I've been doing this now 28 years. I love what I do. I really do. I, I love it. And um, I, I, I enjoy my clients, even in the worst times and the good times. It's great. Um, but I, it boils down to February 8th, 1998. My grandfather, Charlie, lived on uh, Freeman Street, Freeman right off of Billings, cross the street from Pocket School, and uh, he and my grandmother, Bernice, um, my grandfather had COPD, he was passing away, and it was, it, was, it was his time. He was 82 years old, and back then, you know, 24 years ago, 82, oof, man, he lived a good life, right? It's like, jeez. By the way, on a side note, Betty White died at 99, people were like, she died too young. What a beautiful legacy. Like, that is just amazing. But on his deathbed, so we're all around him. And on his deathbed, my mother asked him, you know, do you want some water? And he said, no, thank you. Such a, such a beautiful man. And, um, and my mother said, uh, you know, Dad, are you okay? And he said, I'm okay. He said, uh, just, just take care of Harry. Right? And Harry's the pet name for my, uh, my grandmother, Bernice. And... That time, like at that moment, I knew this is the career I wanted to do. This is what I love to do. My grandfather wasn't worried about what his portfolio was doing. He, wasn't, he didn't care about what his, he worked at Polaroid forever, right? Uh, no longer. So he didn't care about that. All he wanted to do was make sure his wife of 62 years was taken care of. That's all he cared about. The, these different investment vehicles are available to you, right? from not only wealth transfer, but the accumulation of assets and so forth. We have a little time, we can talk about these different types of investment vehicles, but those are available to you, right? Talk to, you know, go online, Google Fidelity, look at Fidelity, look at, you know, Putnam, Eaton Vance, the different mutual fund companies. Look at, um, you know, there's variable annuities, fixed indexed annuities, equity indexed annuities. The annuities, you know, they get such a bad rap um, anybody here of a variable annuity or an annuity in general? Okay, so an annuity is an insurance vehicle. And so it's basically like a mutual fund, but it has an insur insurance wrapper around it. It essentially says you can't lose money. So you put $100,000 into an annuity, you participate in the market, the being a sub-account, um, which is, you know, any type of investment, American funds, Fidelity, Putnam, etc. If you lose money and you die, the beneficiary gets 100% of the money. It all goes back to them. So there's zero beta as we refer to it. I use variable annuities and index annuities for a small, uh, I carve out a certain percentage simply because um, there's no bond exposure. There's no bonds to buy. Bonds are, they're so depressed right now, it's, it's impossible to go ahead and pick up anything more than, you know, you go to a bank, you like, yeah, I had uh, $400,000. They're like, oh, we'll give you um, one, one and a quarter percent. And you're like, whoa, really? 
It's pretty good. Thanks. No, you deserve better. The thing with annuities is they get a bad rap because you have to pay for the insurance. And so the insurance cost. But when it comes down to it, you always look at, in life, I always use this adage that um, value is irrelevant in the face, uh, excuse me, price is irrelevant in the face of value. Will you care what you're paying if you're gonna enjoy it and you're gonna appreciate the value that you're getting? So if you're buying an annuity and it's cost you 3% in fees, insurance costs, portfolio management, and so forth, but you made 25%, your net net is 22, Otherwise, you would have been sitting in the bond making one and a quarter. And you had the ability to go ahead and guaranteed income, guaranteed growth, et cetera, et cetera. But those are different things. That I just wanted to touch on that. A lot of people talk about it. So with that said, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'm very impressed that I've been talking for 50 minutes. It's amazing. Um, in, these, in the kits, you have this thing, uh, this handout. It's defining what wealth means to you. And uh, it, it just basically asks you what does wealth represent to you as a person, telling stories about wealth. Um, and it, it takes away the dollar amount and it puts into memory, you know, creating memories. Because really, we only have a certain amount of time to do this, create monies, or excuse me, creating money creates memories. Um, but it's something to go ahead and look at and write down things that you want to accomplish, right? And then on the back is your mission statement. I give these to all my clients. You know, my clients are my friends now. And I give them to them and I ask them, you know, call a family meeting, write down your values. You know, what's important to you? Discuss your values, choose fewer than 10, construct your mission statement, et cetera, et cetera. And then you live by it. And it's so simple to do because a lot of times, you know, we're just floating out there. But if you write stuff and you hold yourself accountable, you'll begin to go ahead and accumulate wealth. Now, with that, I'm going to wrap. But I want to tell you real quick, I got into it the other day on Facebook, right? Um, I put out something that uh, going to four years at Boston College would cost you $384,000 without any financial aid, right? My niece and nephew were both at Colby College. I think it's, uh, my brother's shelling out about 150,000 bucks a year, right? But he's, he's no longer a Quincy guy. He's up in Maine. And he, when I asked him, like, does it bother you, you know, 150,000? He's like, no, I'm just very, uh, I appreciate life. I appreciate being in a position to be able to afford it. I'm like, oh my God, who are you? I'm like, really? I don't care if I was a billionaire. I'm not shelling 150,000 a year. Anyway. It's a great response, and I'm very proud of him. But, um, so I put it, I, I said, all right, let's talk about education, right? So take the $384,000. Instead of going to college, put that into, go to a trade school or whatever, somewhere you're going to be, uh, uh, it's not going to cost you anything, right? Put that into an investment vehicle that will provide some sort of tax deferral. Uh, you can buy a, 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 an annuity with non-qualified assets, you retain all the asset, all the money that would you be paying taxes, you allow that to compound. Take a guess on the average annual return of the S&P 500 uh, of the life. Anybody knows the, know what that is on average over the last, say, 60 years? Around 11 to 12. 11, 12%, right? So at 11 and a half, I think I even put it at like 13 over the last 10, but over 11 and a half, Anybody want to take a guess on compounded interest over 47, which would bring that 18-year-old, bring her out to 65? Anybody want to take a guess how much that would be worth? Somewhere around $50 million. $120 million. Right? $120 million. That's what financial literacy is all about. We need to start educating our younger people to understand that, hey, listen, before you think that you need to go and, you know, start dumping all this money into college education for something that you may not use just because society tells you you need to. You need to start to look at the fundamental principles of investing, right? Earnings matter. Invest your money. Start young. The younger is the biggest asset you have. And the last thing I'll leave you with, again, we talked about it already. You have 253 days of the year that you can participate in the market. Today's volatility, yesterday's volatility, last week's volatility means nothing. 
if you if it meant something, that means you were not well diversified or not allocated appropriately. And you need to reassess, sit down with someone, um, and you know, address that. Clearly take the risk off the table. All right, so we've got seven minutes. What questions do we have? Yes? What's your opinion of cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency. That's a great question. Um, I'm down. Uh, $84 in crypto. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I took $250 and put it onto uh, Dogecoin because he, he, uh, 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 Elon, Musk. Elon Musk told me that a dog with no value. Uh, it, it's, it's something that I've exposed some clients to, uh, mainly through ETFs, which an ETF is a mutual fund, but it trades like a stock. It's an exchange traded fund. You can trade it during the day. It's, it's um, if Hell comes in a handbasket, I'm able to get out of the market for my clients before mutual funds have to reassess the portfolio and kind of, it's a little tricky. But crypto, um, I don't know too much about it. I, I've studied enough to be dangerous. I've, again, carved out one, two percent for clients. Um, I, I believe in it simply because the emerging markets uh, industry is obviously, it's huge. It's a trillion dollar industry. The thing is, there's three constants that go with investing in emerging markets. It's the currency, the company, and the industry. You can have the best stock in the greatest industry, and if that country goes kaput, so does their currency. The cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, etc., Ethereum, they provide an even playing field where you can invest into emerging markets and not have to worry about what president uh, you know so and so is going to do to the you know the rand or whatever right so i don't think it's going away um, i don't think it acts as a currency obviously currencies don't do what they do uh, the dollar um, and then i'll end with that i don't think the united states at 30 trillion dollars in, um, in in debt by the way we own 93 percent of that debt so whenever anybody says, oh, China owns our debt, China owns 6% of our debt. And by the way, we're lending at basically zero. So they're building all our roads, we're lending money. It's like, yeah, well, we're not paying any interest on it. So um, we're just a safe haven because democracy is so, so important. It's a, it's a great commodity. But um, I don't think the Federal Reserve nor the Treasury is going to go ahead and allow crypto to overtake the dollar. The dollar is a soft currency. We went off that, uh, the Bretton Woods Treaty. Except, well, forget it, I won't get into that, but we went off, we're a soft currency. Democracy um, is our currency. As long as we continue to maintain a capitalist society, this, has no, this isn't politics or anything, as long as we get up every day, put our foot, boots on and go to work, we are supporting the dollar. The dollar is the global currency. I don't see um, crypto ever competing with it, and if it does, I think that there's going to be some... Uh, some bad times for the crypto investor. Right. Any other questions? You're like, I'm a crypto. Yes, Minnesota. Money currently recommended for retirees as opposed to money in fixed income and money held in the market. Yeah, excellent question again. Um, I, I would, fixed income, it, there's, a, there's, a re, there, there's a need for it, right? Um, however, I look at equity investing and uh, I've been doing it. Uh, most of my clients are all in equity for my retirees. Um, we carve out about 24 months of income, right? So we have about two years of cash, short-term uh, bonds, okay? U.S. Treasuries, et cetera. We put that in there. The majority is spread over a diversified portfolio that allows clients to participate in the equity markets, both international and domestic. Never in the history has a market not come back over a 24 to 36 month period. So we're able to go ahead and it, you know, dollar cost or, or systematically withdraw from the equity positions. Meanwhile, if we have another March 2020, we'll be able to go ahead and utilize that buffer with the cash that we have in place. So um, you, you, in order to maintain um, pace with the number one concern, which is outliving your assets. This is the number one concern facing every retiree today. It's not taxation, it's not market volatility, it's not control, um, it's outliving the assets. Um, 
it's, 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 it's mandatory that you have equity exposure. And we talked a little bit about variable annuities and fixed index annuities. Those are other vehicles that have provided the peace of mind. We're always looking for SWAN. That's all we want, SWAN, right? Remember Quan? Was it Quan? Yeah, we just want SWAN. We want to sleep well at night. That's all we want to do. And you can find those. They're, they're, they're available. Um, um, but my big thing on that one is if you're going to talk to a financial advisor and all they're going to push on you is annuities, you probably want to walk out the door. Because it's like, why are you going there? Like, do you sell anything else? You know, talk to a financial advisor that's licensed to all be it a CFP, a SEMA, Series 7, 63, 65, 66. Um, the analogy I often use is if you talk to a financial advisor and all they can do is shop at Stop and Shop from aisle 1 to 3 and aisle 4 to, you know, or excuse me, aisle 25 to 30, they're probably not a good fit. You want to talk to somebody that's going to be able to advise you through every aisle and be able to go ahead and select different investments from our, each aisle contingent on your risk tolerance and your time horizon. Let's say I make $100,000 a year. How much, like, if you were thinking percentages, yeah. I didn't know if this had to make sense. My question makes sense, but how should I allocate that $100,000? Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it's, it's, I mean, it's an excellent question. Let me see. Uh, uh, not that. Then, as a follow-on to that, like, I had a 401k, but my financial advisor suggested I roll it into a Roth. Okay. So now I have nothing in a 401k. Okay. I have no 401k. I just have a Roth. Okay. What, what does that mean? Okay, so your Roth IRA, um, question is simple, went from, she left her job, took her 401k, rolled it into a Roth IRA. How long ago did you do that? Uh, a year and a half. Okay, all right, so um, you've got to pay taxes on what you took out yeah. you know, when you put it into the Roth. There's provisions that give you, you know, you can ladder out and spread out the taxes, which is great. Um, the... Uh, so now you're in a Roth IRA. You can put $6,000 a year away, right? Here's another thing and I didn't touch on, um, and I'm glad you brought it up, so thank you. If you're in an employer that has sponsored a Roth provision in their 401k, 457, there is no income limitations on that, which means you can invest, if you're 50 or below, or 49 or below, you can invest $20,500 into a Roth, doesn't matter if you make $10 million into the Roth provision of your 457 or 401k and $6,000 into your, your IRA for a total of $26,500. What does that mean? That means unlike a traditional 401k where the money is going pre-tax, so instead of making 100, you put 10,000, now you only made 90. If you put 10,000 to a Roth, you still made 100. You don't get that immediate gratification of the tax benefit in the year it's put in. However, and this is why your advisor was smart to give you this, she directed you correctly because that money grows tax free. If you're a pensioner and you have a pension and you have the ability to go into a Roth IRA, you go into a Roth provision. Simply because if you're a pensioner and you get, you know, say your pension's $120,000 a year, and then you have a traditional 457, 401k, et cetera, you then have to attach that, so that's gonna kick you up to a higher tax bracket. If you're in a Roth, guess what? You're right there. You do not pay additional taxes on that. So where your money is now, you're just in a Roth. It's a great vehicle. You can go wherever you want. You can trade it, do whatever you want. Um, and uh, no, it's good. It's, 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 it, was, it was smart. It takes a little bite, you know, because you gotta pay the taxes. But um, over the long term, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be phenomenal. And so that, was a, that was a great move. Well, listen, I really, this is the first time I've done this. Uh, again, thank you for the, 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 the Thomas Crane. Thank you. Thank you so, thank much. You so much. Appreciate it. And thank you at all at home for watching. <laughs>